Welcome to another episode of Junior Achievement of South Florida's Recipe for Success. Just as there are no two recipes that contain the exact same ingredients or measurements, there are no two success stories exactly the same. Recipe for Success features entrepreneurs, visionary leaders, and innovators of all ages who will share the ingredients that make them successful. Here's your host, Lori Salarulo, President and CEO of Junior Achievement of South Florida. Hey everyone, and welcome to this episode of JA's Recipe for Success. I am Lori Salarulo, and I'm your host today uh, on behalf of Junior Achievement. It's my pleasure to bring someone to you today who I don't know. I think I thought I had a lot of energy, but this guy he <laughs> blows it out of the water and puts me to shame. Um, and not only that, but just a uh, an amazing all around person, savvy businessman. Uh, I, I just honestly, I, I don't, there's not enough I can say uh, as I watch this man, especially lead through this pandemic. I'm so excited and it's been a while that we've been trying to get him on the show and get him scheduled because he's been so busy. So please help me welcome to today's show, the Executive Vice President, the Las Olas Company and the General Manager of the Riverside Hotel, um, who was also named one of the top 500 most influential leaders in Florida, which is no surprise to anyone who knows him. Please help me welcome Heiko Dobrico. And here we go. Let's get him into the show. Hello. Hello. <laughs> bon appetit. How are you? Bon appetit. And you know, I forgot. I was going to say in my um, introduction, I will never forget, and I don't think anybody in Broward County will ever forget, your speech at, uh, I think it was at the First Baptist Church room. And you did a speech when you were receiving a, an award from the chamber, and you talked about goosebumps. Yes. And I will never, never forget. Anytime I hear the word goosebumps, now I think of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. I hope I'm glad it's embedded in you, you know, but hey, listen, uh, when, when you talk about energy and you and I are both energy leaders, you know, we, we know this, you know, it, it truly is about about energy and goosebumps, right? When you know that you're connecting with the person, right, and you're building a great relationship, you know, that that is just second to none. Nowadays, you know, and, and I always have the, the, the saying, your, your network is your net worth. And when I when I listen to my grandfather, who often guided me along the way, uh, he, he said, Heike, you know, it's very important for you to know what you know, but it's more important who you know. However, most important is who wants to get to know you. Wow. And that just blew me away. I didn't even know how to tackle the last uh, advice that he gave me, right? The first one, what you know, is education, right? And for the audience, we just never stop learning. We just keep learning, you know? And and it doesn't matter what age you are, you know, you, you, will, always, uh, you will always improve yourself, you know? And then you start building relationships, right? who you know, you who you're going to build a relationship with. And at the end of the day, you have really choices who you want to surround yourself with. And uh, I found that mesmerizing when he he planted that seed in, in me that it says, you know, it's very important who you know. But then I struggled with the last one where he says, and who wants to get to know you? And that just blew me away. And I said, like, how am I going to do this, Right. I'm going to get the information out there that people should reach out to me and want to get to know me. And in 1984, I listened to Warren Buffett, and, and Warren said something very important about leadership to me, which, which was, was just the thing that really hit home for me. He said one of the most important leadership, as, as leadership skills that one should have should be the aspect of public speaking. And so I went, like, public speaking? What is he talking about? And then I kind of connected it. If you public speak in the morning to your team in order to get them ready, they listen to you. And if you make the content rich, they want to get to know you more because you are investing in them. So then when you go public speak at, a, at an industry event, right? You give content and people may think that you have a tremendous amount of knowledge and they will reach out to you. You know, a lot of times people, when, when, when I'm a moderator, they think I'm the smartest guy in the room. 
but actually the panel are much smarter. And so even being the moderator, people reach out to you because I'm the one that asks all the important questions. So they think they, that I'm the smart one, which is probably not the truth. I'm, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, you know, but at the end of the day, uh, what grandpa said, you know, if, if, if you sharpen your skill in public speaking and you build that confidence in order to uh, connect with your audience and connecting with you or connecting with the audience today that we have, right? We want to make sure that the content that they're getting today is really a recipe for success so that they can do something with it and they're going to have nuggets to to walk away with and and, and get better at it so yeah so true and by the way whether it's, we're talking to our high schoolers right or our middle schoolers about preparing for success or we're talking to our peers and and so two things come to mind two words come to mind as you were talking about that one is basically becoming a thought leader Right. That's kind of what you're saying. When you become a thought leader and pe people see you as an expert because you've shared your knowledge and you've reached out to other people, right, to help them, to share with them, to help them grow, people see you as a thought leader. And so, and then the second part that I, I heard you talking about was really part of that is also about building your brand because I, I don't know about you, but I, I know this to be true for you as well. My brand is JA. That's Even it. though it's Lori, it's JA. When people see me, they know that's my passion. They know that is my profession. They know that is what I love doing. It's what excites me. When people think of you, they think of Riverside. They think of Los Olas Company, right? So talk a little bit about that thought leader piece combined with that branding and how it also helps your company. Sure. So that, that's a very in, in interesting question. And uh, let me talk about the three O's then, right? Because when you're a thought leader, you, you need to make sure that you have your folks that you're working with take ownership of, of your brand that you have. I cannot be everywhere every single day with every one of my team members, right? I just can't. It's impossible. Um, you know, I have already a split personality, but I cannot split myself in 300 ways, right? So giving them the first O, which is ownership, right? And trusting them that they will run the business like it was their own. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be important. So that's part of the investment piece where you need to make sure that you hire the right person for the right job at the right time, that you make sure that that person gets the right training, and the right tools in order to execute the job. And you need to trust them when you are not there that they just will make the right decisions. The second O is truly the aspect of being challenged every single day with problems, issues, challenges, and curveballs that are coming just their way, right? Well, if I did a good job or we did a good job in training them and provide them with the knowledge and how to react to any situation that's out there, they just should take the glove of ownership and grab that curveball that's coming their way. Take it and turn it into an opportunity, meaning resolve the problem that there is, right? Whatever curveball is coming your way, I trust you that you will handle it. Now, will you always handle it properly? Probably not. Right. I make mistakes every single day. Right. But I learn from my mistakes. Will I ridicule you when you made the wrong decisions? I'm telling you, if you just take charge and make a decision, right, wrong and different. At least you made the decision. You took the chance. You build your confidence and you actually create much better energy for yourself in taking charge. The last O is really the reward. Right. It's an ovation. It's a celebration of success where I'm going to see, you know what, this is this is a go-getter here. She probably can climb the ladder and, and really become something. Oh, thank you. I hope I do someday. Thank oh, you. you. You do this every single day. Oh, were you not talking to me? <laughs> but maybe she can climb the ladder. Maybe we need to invest in some more training. Maybe we need to make sure that she gets the tuition reimbursement that she needs. Maybe it is 
uh, the team member of the month or leader of, of the quarter, that th those are all ovations, right? Or sometimes the ovation is as simple as just a clap on the shoulder where you're just going to say, at a boy, at a girl, you did a great job. I could sleep better because you took care of it. Those are the three O's, you know, ownership, uh, opportunities, and ovation. You have the other three O's as well you, that you can choose if you're kind of a lame duck, right? It's out of order, not my job. Mm. And, you know, have we seen that as well, an unproductive uh, organization where people just are there to collect a paycheck. Yeah. But as long as you empower them, even though not I'm the greatest uh uh, advocate for the word empowerment, but if you empower them, and, and I think it's more about trust, if you build the trust with them that they're going to make the right decisions, I think you're just going to catapult out there and you're going to have have just a phenomenal organization. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I will tell you that, you know, I love I love this stuff. I, I, I don't read fiction books hardly ever. I read leadership books. It's all I read, right? And so I love that connection uh, between you and I always talking about this stuff. But it's interesting. And, and you know, when I came to JA, it was a totally different culture. Um, and they had gone through something very difficult. And, and I would say the last three to four years were really dedicated to building the culture that you're talking about right? It does not happen overnight. I can tell you that from experience, right? You're trying to run the business. You're trying to build the culture. You've got people that have been here for years. You're trying to change their mindset. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Some, so sometimes it means you're moving and bringing in new people because if you create the environment, what I have found, and then I want to hear your thoughts on this, that you create, you begin to create that culture of ownership and, and we call it entrepreneurship because that's what we teach, yeah. right? So you own that program or that business. Well, if you're not taking ownership and you're not accountable and you're not stepping up, you're going to feel really uncomfortable in that culture. But it takes a while to get there. Talk a little bit about, I know that didn't happen overnight in a big hotel, right? Well, you're 100% right. And you know, culture is everything. Culture is the end result of the hard work that you have. And, you know, I just gave you the appetizer with the three O's. Let me take you to the main course recipe right now, right? And let's talk about it. I'm playing on your, your recipe for success uh, ideology right there, right? So let me just tell you what, what, it, what it is. You know, you, you have various uh, company cultures. You have very uh, vertical structures, up and down structures, which are kind of like you have a president, CEO, you have your executive committee, you have your division heads, your department heads, your, your managers, your supervisors, and then the staff. And usually in a structure like this, whatever the top says, the bottom will do. It rolls downhill, right? And then there's also cultures that are flat structures right? Where everybody's on the same level. Actually, I am on the same level as the general manager of the hotel, as the utility person that wash the, washes the dishes every single day. But in order for us to create this amazing culture, we need some very important component, right? Number one, I, I think, is a pinch of passion. You mm. got to just get people that love what they do. You know, if, if you get an introverted person into a sales job, I don't think that person will ever win. And at the end of the day, everybody wants to win. So it be behooves us to really identify what are the passions of these amazing people, right? And have a good conversation with them before you get them started at work, that you hire the right person for the right job that is going to fall in love with their job. Because when they fall in love with their job, they just going to be overachievers. They're going to make it happen and, and they're going to be successful. I think the other component to this recipe is going to be the value that you're going to put in people, right? Don't think of people as a line item on your PL, that it's a labor line, right? Think of it that it's an investment line. And it's the most important investment that you're actually doing. Make sure that you have common courtesy with your, your people, value what they are, get to know them, right? Human resources at one point screwed it up for cor corporate America. You cannot get personal with the, with the team any longer. But it's proven that if you treat your team like family and get to know them as 
family, once you have hired them, they're going to warm up to you and they're going to be much better producers. Follow the golden rule, right? You right. know, treat them like you want to be treated. You know, nobody wants to be treated bad. So value your people. I think the next uh, portion of the recipe would be integrity. Yeah. You know, integrity is so important. You know, the team members know when you fib to them. Just don't fib. Be honest to them. Treat them fair. Make sure that your actions are actually real and that they are natural, right? And always think about doing the right thing. You know, that's important. Doing the right thing will just catapult you into a new, new, new element of it. I think the next uh, portion of the recipe that I would like to talk about is, is the aspect of constant improvement, right? Nobody wants to be just stagnant in a job. Everybody wants to take it from one level to the next level, to the next level, to the next level. But when you build this constant improvement philosophy, be realistic when you build those goals. If your goals are unrealistic and you are here and you want to get there, but you want to get there in an unrealistic time, you're never going to get there. At the end of the day, they give up. But if you do one step at a time and celebrate the successes in small increments, they're just going to rocket for you. They're just going to be awesome for you, you know. Uh, you know and, and it's so interesting that you said that because I, I just finished telling you that it took three to four years, right, to build this. And one of the things that I'm not, although I've had to develop, is patience because mm -hmm. It takes, you know, that your organization is capable of going here. But like you said, we're here. So how do we get there? Because we might want, we might be able to go from here to here in, in 30 seconds, right? We're like mm -hmm. Teslas, okay? But not everybody That's can right. get there that quickly. So you're right. But that means patience. Yeah. Yeah. Patience is important, you know, and and that patient needs to translate into the next component of of this recipe is really your interaction with your customer. Mm. You know, hospitality is everywhere. You know, you know, I'm in the hospitality industry. I work for the Riverside Hotel. I've been in the hospitality industry for a long time. But if you think about it, hospitality is everywhere. When you go to a bank, do you think there's hospitality? When you go to Publix or to to Aldi, do you think there's hospitality? When you go to the 7-Eleven, you think there's hospitality. When you go to... Do you not think there's hospitality? Right. And at, at the end of the day, the customer is the boss. Because at the end of the day, when you look at your paycheck that you get and you look at the signature that's at the end of the paycheck, it's actually it's it's the name of every customer that you actually served. At the end of the day, we're all in the service industry. Right. We all serve somebody because whether you are on top of the organization or whether, whether you are in the middle of the organization or whether you're on the bottom of the organization, we all serve each other. You know, that's why I think servant leadership is uh, so important. And that recipe that I just gave you gives you the unique culture that I call servant leadership in a corporate environment. You know, at the end of the day, you have to hold everybody accountable. Right. Nobody likes ambiguity. People just hate ambiguity. Tell me to go left, go right, or let's have a discussion whether we should go left or right or forward or backward, whichever way it is, right? And getting your teams to work together and collaborate and really embrace the aspect of a flat structure where we serve each others and we lead to serve others, right, first. That creates this leadership culture of servant leadership in a corporate environment. And it works, you know, and you can do it within your department. You can create that kind of a leadership structure in the small nucleus of your, your own small department, or you can make it even bigger, right? You make it for the entire company and, and it works. I, I think culture, what you said earlier, culture is just everything, right? At the end of the day, it's unique. Your culture at your organization is different than my culture that we have at our organization because you and I are naturally different people. Right. And people just follow the pace of the leader, right? And so you have so maybe- I want, to keep up with you. I want to know how they keep up with you because you're like the ever ready bunny. But, but that's how they all are. 
Right. They all are on a go, 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 right? If I reduce my speed, Laurie, the entire pack will lose their speed. If I go at 10 miles an hour, the entire, because everybody's always watching us. Mm -hmm. Every oh, yeah. interaction that we have with our teams and the outside and the community and the world, as a matter of fact, because we are now on digital media, right? We, we, are, we are actually all global now. Everybody is watching, you, right? And if you go 10 miles an hour, everybody will follow you at 10 miles an hour. If you go 100 miles an hour, everybody will go 100 miles an hour, right? Yeah. And I think what you, you know, what we said earlier, the people who don't want to go 100 miles an hour and just want to go 10, they start to realize that this is not the right place for them. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, and so I think I want to read you something because you said something just now that so we recently our team does a book club. We have a senior leadership and then the leadership team and we're, we're do, all doing the same book. So then at some point we come together and we only split it because it was too many people and it gives the, the frontline managers a chance to really talk about issues for them. And then it gives the senior directors and managers a chance to, to talk about things that are specific to them. And so uh, we read a lot of the books by Mark Miller, who was the leadership development at Chick-fil-A. And I love the way he writes these books like fables. And so one of the exercises in the first book, which is called serve uh, the secret, he, they talk about defining leadership for your team. Cause if you all have a different definition, Right. You're not all going in the same place. So so we made a leadership pizza recently and then we pulled from the pizza. We pulled our definition of leadership. And, and to your point, our definition is building and empowering a strong, empathetic and passionate team focused on a clear vision and committed to serving each other and our community. Bingo. Love it. I love it. So that is our definition of leadership. Um, and it is true exactly to your point. But I will tell you, watching this, watching their mindset shift has been one of the most rewarding experiences for me as a leader. I go, you know what? Look, we could bring in millions of dollars. You could bring in millions of dollars of business. And all of that is nice. And it pays our checks. And, and it, it's, a, it's an amazing accomplishment. But to me, building this culture and helping people to grow is really what I love, right? It's why I love what we do, 50,000 kids a year, right? We're helping to prepare them and help them grow so that they can become leaders like you and I. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting when you talked about the book, book club, and I don't know whether you guys are doing this. I believe no book should ever be on a bookshelf, okay? Read the book, sign it, pass, it, pass on. it on, right? So just... Just create that book club where the book's just constantly flowing, right? Yeah. And a lot of times when I do public speaking to the universities, I bring books all the time and I sign them, right? And I say, listen, these are not my books, but these are books that I read, that I love, that helped me in who I am today. And why don't you read it? And once you're done with it, hand it over That's to a person right. that you think uh, is going to get value out of that particular book. And have yeah. that person then sign it when they read it and then pass it on and on and on. Eventually, you're going to see the book having just tons of signatures and it actually floated around and people got to read uh, and improve their knowledge. I love it. And, and I, I do that often. I will often give some of the books that we're doing because people will say, like, what? What, what kind of drugs is your team on? Like they all love what they do. And then, and I mean, you know, and I say, I, I only have to say, I have to give the books credit because being able to talk about this. And the other part is, I go and, and I want, maybe you could touch on this. When we're in these book clubs together, I say to them, this is something I'm working on as well, right? Or this is, we talk about how to activate things in the book, right? What am I going to do to practice being a servant leader, right? Whatever the chapter might be on. I share with them what I'm working on, showing them that we are continuing to grow and that I'm not giving you this book so you can learn, but I'm already there. Talk a little bit about that authenticity and that vulnerability. Well, first of all, you just got to put yourself out there, right? And you cannot be afraid of just making mistakes. Make mistakes because you're going to learn from the mistakes and it's going to make you, you better. But don't only think that you are you are in a box 
that you are only pigeonholed for one thing. You know, one of the things in my industry that I felt for years, for decades actually, that many of the leaders of the hospitality industry just don't think past their property line, past their business, that they are not getting engaged in community. You know, you, you have to find balance in life, right? They, they call work-life balance, right? Well, why don't we do work-life community. community balance, right? And the moment that you put community in, you're actually creating a grassroots program where you are now saying, we're going to entrench, in our, uh, entrench yourself into the community. Look at the Riverside Hotel. The Riverside Hotel has, has been in existence in this com community since 1936. We are over 80 years in this community, but everybody knows the Riverside Hotel, right? And we are family owned and operated, fourth generation with Mr. Weymouth at, at the helm right now. And Barbara is, is one of our, is the main own, owner, Barbara Wells, of course, you know. And uh, if you just think about this, you know, very rarely do you see now a hotel or hospitality that has had the same ownership for four generations. That's amazing. But the ownership really set the blueprint for what we want to do with this community. Because they said from day one, we will be part of this community. We will engage with the community. We will help uh, Broward Health or Broward General way back when. We will help, help the Parker uh, Playhouse. We will help others. And the same thing for us, right? You all become suddenly philanthropic by just seeing the generosity of a family like this that are giving so much in sweat, work, tears for the community and uplifting the community. And if you think about this, if all of our businesses would just spend a little bit more energy in this silo called community, we all become a much better community. You know, I don't, don't want to talk politics, but you know, you have Washington DC and they have been gridlocked for over 20 years. Well, if we want to fix our communities, we have to fix them ourselves from the bottom up. We yeah. have to work on it. We have to serve in our communities to make them better. You know, I have, I have a simple saying, and you're gonna, you can take this to the bank, you know. Uh, the saying is, you have two choices. You can either sit at the table or be on the menu. The choice is yours. I like to sit at the table. I don't want to be eaten and be on the menu. I want to enjoy the meal and I want to make, make the decisions and I want to steer the direction of, of the meal that we're going to have. But don't tell, tell me that I'm going to be the meal, right? Yeah. And those are our choices, you know, that we have. So yeah. if, if you just use that simple sentence, you know, you can either sit at the table or be on the menu, choice is yours. I yeah, don't know. Take the choice, you know, and and listen. Nobody knows the generosity of the Wells family better than Junior Achievement. They're uh, recently, uh, I guess it was about two and a half, three years ago, when they named the pavilion, um, and and it was a very interesting conversation. And they talked about we had a, a bond, a note on our building, uh, and it had a we had a mortgage, and they said we 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 want you to be debt free. And so that was their, they're very big, I know, on financial literacy and being debt free and preparing for the future, which of course is what we teach. Um, and so there's that, that synergy of, of understanding and supporting people in that way. But let's talk for a moment because you mentioned the industry. Mm -hmm. I want to I talk a little bit about where the industry is today, number one. And then number two, right, because the industry has struggled or is struggling uh, through all of this, how do we, how will it, it change the workplace, right? Or the, the future jobs? And how do we share the jobs in hospitality with these young people when they see how hard the industry is getting hit right now? Yeah. So first, first and foremost, you know, this is in, in my 30 plus years, this is the hardest I've ever gotten, gotten hit. You know, I've been through the Great Depression. I've been through 9-11. I've been through the oil crisis. I've been through all the different elements of, of crises that you could have. And small crises like, like hurricanes, right? That's a crisis. Um, but this pandemic really hit our industry very, very hard because we live off travel, right? 
we cannot sustain in our hotels of just local business. We need to have visitors coming from, from out of state, from other countries, international, what have you, right? And that's how we're going to survive. And, uh, you know, our, our air travel is not quite there yet, but it will build up again. It's not going to build up as fast as we think it will. For example, when you take a look at the aspect of our restaurants, our restaurants are actually doing very well, even though that we have currently only 50% capacity, seating capacity that, that we are allowed to have. But there's a pent up demand with a lot of the folks that have been now working from home and, and just being in a quarantine per se, right? They want you to get out and just eat. And uh, we eventually will see that travel will pick up again, right? The, the rules will, will be loosened. We're going to go eventually into a full-fledged phase two. It might take us three, four, five, six months in order to get that completed, to get into the full-fledged phase two. Because at the end of the day, it's about the discipline of our visitors and our residents. You know, And at, at, at the beginning of the pandemic, we weren't disciplined. So everything thing spiked, right? And we learned our lessons. We have to wear a mask. We have to social distance. We have to wash our hands. We have to be careful, right? That's going to be important. Now that we are all trained and we know what we have to do, we will eventually build our business up again. I foresee that this is going to happen probably in the next two, three years where we are going to get back to COVID, pre-COVID-19 uh, numbers. Um, Business travel is going to slowly pick up. Then eventually the convention business is going to come back. Leisure business will maintain at an, at an even flow. And uh, once those different segmentations of the business coming back, um, I think we're going to do good. There's, there's just no other industry like the hospitality industry. You are in the industry of just making people happy. That's your number one goal. You just want to make people laugh, have a good time. Let me get you a drink. Let me get you good food. Let me get you a good sleep. Let me get you a great experience that is unique. Let me just introduce you our community that we have. You know, and when you think about the young folks that are out there that are, that are tossing, tossing and turning and trying to figure out what to do. Listen, if you're passionate about cooking and we're talking about the recipe of success, the kitchen is awesome. I love cooking and I would go up and show you my belly because I love to eat as well, right? <laughs> but I just love it, right? And if you're passionate about cooking, think about getting a trade skill certification. There's more pathways to the American dream than just going through high school and then going to a four-year college and then maybe getting a master's and then a PhD. You can go to a trade skill school. Your school will be taken care of. You will work while you're in school and... I mean, there's electricians that are making 100000 a year. There's executive chefs that are making over 100000 a year, right? What a great career, you know? So so don't think that, that there's only one way after you get out of high school. There's more than one way, right? If you're great with your hands and you know how to do things, that's great. If you're a methodical thinker and you 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 like the academy, academia of, of education, then that's what it is. Because you said it earlier about education, and that's what the Wells family loves so much. They are so in tuned in education. The number one economic driver in our country or in the world is education. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, everybody wants to live yeah. where there's good education. Absolutely. And, and of course, education uh, and experience leads to jobs, right? And then that leads to financial security. And so that breaks down all kinds of divides, right, in our community. Um, and I just think, you know, this is why we do what we do with 50,000 kids a year. It's about having them exposed, right? You do an amazing job. You do a career day on hospitality at the Riverside. And these kids come back like going, I never knew there were that many jobs in hospitality, right? They think of a server or a bartender or, you know, they know two or three, but that's about it. And so when you open their eyes to the world, to the plethora of opportunities right here in our very own county. And you don't have to go to college for them, as you said, because not every kid is a college kid, right? Or some may go back to college later on, but they're not quite ready for it now. We have to be prepared to help them find that passion, as you said. I think that's the yeah. most important thing. Yeah. And so, so, so important. Um, you know, look, we went through this in 9-11. Uh, the, the, the travel industry took a really 
big hit then. Uh, it took two to three years for that to come back. Uh, but I anticipate that it'll it'll come back in in that time. And so, uh, you know, people like you who are passionate about this industry and, and our community will make sure that it comes back. I mean, Heiko, I, I don't know how to thank you. There's so much, I, I took three pages of notes in here. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you could see me kind of writing drastically. Um, and, and I love it, and and I I have to go back and join. I know you sent me an invitation for Z Servant Leader Tribe, and so I will do that um, as soon as we hang up because it's been on my list to do. And um, and I, I can't thank you enough. Our students, our community, um, myself, we are so fortunate to have someone as passionate as you, someone with your humor. Because you know we didn't talk about that, but I really think that keeping things optimistic and humorous sometimes, right? You know, that whole goosebump thing. You know, last night I, when you said you were looking forward to coming, I texted you a little, you know, gif thing and that, that was the goof. We have to maintain our sense of humor through all of this. And you do such an amazing job of that. So thank well, you. Well, thank you, Lauren. Right back at you. you. You're amazing as well. And what you're doing at Junior Achievement is just phenomenal. So let me finish up with the dessert now for, for everyone. Right. You know, at the end of the day, it's just follow your dreams. Just yeah. follow your dreams, right? That is the sweetness about life. You know, if you do something where you cannot get up in the morning that you get excited about, change. You have plenty of opportunities to do whatever you want. You have one life to live. You know, I'm over 50 years old and my entire body is just falling apart. I don't know. It came with the AARP card, I think, right? And it's just not working like it used to, right? And, and whatever it is. But at the end of the day, I wake up in the morning and I'm so excited because I love what I do to be with my peeps. My peeps yeah. are everything, right? And it's not only the peeps that I work with, it's peeps like you, Laurie, right? Like the community leaders that we have, right? Do something that you just fall in love with and follow your dreams, you know? Somebody might say, no, 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 no. You need to go in accounting. You need to accounting. But you actually have an artistic neck and you want to go into arts? Go into the arts. Yeah, because you're going to be miserable otherwise. That's it. That's it. So in order to enjoy your dessert, just make it a dream dessert and just follow along your dreams, whatever you have. So uh, in it. closing, you know, thank you to come and have dessert at the place tonight. There we go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me, Laurie. This was great. I had no idea where this was going to take us. And, and we said that at the beginning, right? We have no idea where this conversation is going to take us. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and letting uh. me talk to you. Well, I appreciate you being here. I know that you have been working like crazy um, and that you and your team must be exhausted. But I will tell you that you have been an amazing ambassador for the brand, for hospitality, for safety in our community and getting people to do what they need to do. So thank you so much for all that you are doing. Uh, I, I have not seen anybody do it better. Um, truly, and I mean that um, with all my heart. I, I tell you that every time I talk to you, that I am totally motivated, and I love this leadership stuff. I think we need to go on the road together or something, teaching leadership. I love it. I love it. Um, Let's do it. So, so uh, you, you, you are talking my language. So thank you for being here. Thanks for all that you do. And I want to thank everyone who's watching today. Um, man, did you luck out today? Because we had one of the most amazing guests here who, who, who if you aren't inspired and motivated by today, then I, I don't know what's going to do it for you. So thanks again for being here and let's keep it cooking. <laughs>